So if you will go with me to Luke 24, and we'll start with the first verse. And it says this, but on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? Do that one again. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise? And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to be to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen clothes by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord God, thanking you for this opportunity for us to gather together in your holy name. We thank you for your love, your grace, your mercy towards us. We thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity that we have in this higher level of education, in this holy institution to learn more about you, to deepen our relationship with you, and Lord, for you to give us the tools, Lord God, the guidance, Lord God, and the moral compass that we need to walk in the path of righteousness for your name's sake. Lord, I pray for each and every one that's listening to the sound of my voice today, that Lord God, they will be hearing you directly, Lord God, that Lord, you will reach out, Lord God, into them, Lord God, to touch their hearts, Heavenly Father, that this will be a word, Lord God, that will be not only life-changing, Lord God, but it will be a word of restoration, a word, Lord God, of revival, a word, Lord God, of release, Lord God, a word, Lord God, that gives them rest in you, Lord God, and confidence, Lord God, to know, Lord God, that you are a God who cannot lie, and what you declare, Lord God, it surely shall come to pass. So I pray for each and every one of our SUM students, Lord God, the faculty, Lord God, this institution, Lord God, that you continue to use us to grow, Lord God, to go ye out, Lord God, to all of the nations, Lord God, so that we can accomplish Lord, the great commission in your name, sake, Lord, and we give you glory, honor, and praise. In the master's name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 So this is you know, always kind of difficult because we've come into this realm of this is the way that we, you know, actually minister, you know, because we don't kind of, you know, how I kind of like the, you know, the feedback or, you know, the 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 amens that come or the preach, you know, brothers that come along. And so I know you're not able, you know, to really do that right there. But those of you who are on with me, if there's something that resonates with you, just use your holy amen, which means there's some clapping symbols. I think there's a a little celebration one, but just reaction symbols that you can give if something resonates with you, I'll go ahead and take that most since we have to adapt, you know, to the level that we're in right now. Thank you, Crystal. That's how that works right there. So here we go. We have this story right here. These three women, and it says in the other women, so there was more than that. And depending on which gospel you are reading, it means on which one is determined, on which one is actually named. And so you have to go into in-depth study, you know, and usually when I'm, you know, in, especially in the word, and especially when it comes to our students, I am putting enough out there, um, but I actually encourage, and I hope, you know, that in your study time is that you don't just take my word for it, right? You actually go and you study yourself, take, you know, the what you're hearing and go to the word of God, to go to God, to go to the throne of grace yourself, and, and use the tools that you have been given to basically rightly divide the word, dissect the word, and understand how does this apply, you know, to me. You no, know, I, I wouldn't come into another chapel, you know, if you have well, as a checkoff box for an assignment or as a checkoff box for a requirement. I would never take advantage of the Lord's grace of his mercy and just of his presence you know, of knowing that there's something that he has for me in this moment and in this time. So if we're looking at this, I encourage you to go deeper, right? Go deeper. This is not enough time to, to go deep into that. And I'm not going to also take that holy privilege that some of us as pastors take, where we think we got to preach the whole Bible, you know, in the 20 minutes that we have, right? So with this situation, we're just going to focus on the ones in Luke, and that's Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and also uh, Mary, the mother of James. Now, these women, 
they had, you know, they, they were the ones that actually considered financing actually the, 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 the ministry of Jesus. So you know that they were important. And in the context, if you read there, they're considered as, as one of the, not the, the main disciples, but considered as disciples, you know, to Jesus. And just this story alone just kind of tells you the depth of their caring and the depth of their concern and love, you know, for Jesus. And why did they love him so much? It's because, I mean, of the different aspects, they all had a distinct purpose and motivation for their following of Jesus, you know, but it was a common uh, denominator between the three. Um, for instance, let's just go with uh, Mary Magdalene. You know, she, deliver, she was delivered from seven demons. Uh, we have, you know, a Joanna, you know, who also was delivered from evil spirits and everything. And Joanna was actually the wife of, of Hupa, um, Huza, Huza, I'm sorry, Huza, um, who was actually the steward that headed the house of Herod. And so, and apparently, you know, and, that she had, you know, her own type of money or finances, whether that was an inheritance or something like that, but she, she had it well off. And she was one that was basically supporting and putting money really into to Jesus' campaign, into his uh, campaign, which I'm so loose to my world war, into his ministry, <laughs> right? And then you have Mary, the mother of James. Um, this was, you know, her James, her son, was considered the younger James, they would call him the lesser James. He wasn't the one that we know, you know, that wrote the, 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 the scripture and everything, but he was the lesser James. But the story about this is that you have Mary Magdalene and you have Joanna, who were delivered from evil spirits, delivered from demons. And so basically, and then Mary, the mother whose son followed Jesus, you know, and who had been, you know, his own encounter with Jesus. So when a son, those of you who are mothers that knows when your child is transformed, and I mean, the Lord just really develops, you know, a, a, a relationship with them and they transform your child, like you're going to go see what that's about, whether, you know, in human or in spirit, but you are going to even deepen your love for God because of what you see him doing in your family. For, for Joanna and for Mary Magdalene, I mean, they were so grateful because it was something only God could do, right? It was only something at, the, at least in those point, because there was a couple of instances where the disciples were able to do that. They weren't able to cast out, you know, he had to actually discuss that and, you know, and, and have a conversation with them about, you know, their faith and, you know, and what they were doing. But to be delivered of something. I mean, have you ever been in that place where you just know it was nothing but Jesus? You think about what you've been through, you think about what you used to be, who you were, you know, you know, prior to coming into the realization. I often say to people, you know, I didn't even know how bad I needed to be saved until I got saved. Right. And so, and it's my love for him because of what he's done for me, because I can't even think of anyone in the world that will love me and know everything about me and still love me and never judge me, you know, and, and still give me, you know, access to the family kingdom, the family inheritance, is that there's no one like God, right? No other friend like Jesus, you know, no one like him. And so this actually propelled them into their motivation. This was the common denominator of their following him was the motivation of their love for him because of their gratitude. They all were grateful um, to the Lord. Let me tell you something about being grateful. When you have a group of people, and I'm telling you all these people that are getting ready to go in ministry now are going to be going into ministry. Just listen, when you have people who are grateful to the Lord about what he's done for them, they can be sitting on a cardboard box and they still wouldn't be telling you about changing your carpet. They could be coming in and the air wasn't working right. And they wouldn't be telling you about the conditions of your building they, because they would be so grateful and have such an attitude. They just would be grateful to be in the presence of the Lord and to be with the worship of the saints. When you are dealing with grateful people, there's a different attitude that happens. I often say as someone who knows how to cook is that I don't like cooking for people who are full. People who are full are critical. You come in and they're critical and they'll criticize. But people who are hungry, they'll come in and they're grateful, they're appreciative, right? Because they're hungry. You guys probably have noticed that, you know, even when we go out, you know, evangelizing something like that, you know, people that are hungry are they're usually it's the people that are full. And when I'm talking about people that are full, I'm talking about people that have been sitting in the in, in the church. I'm not gonna say they are the church, but people who have been sitting in the church eating, 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 getting fat on the world and now they're critical about everything that comes in. They have lost their hunger and their thirst for righteousness. And so therefore they just come in just to criticize the meal. You'll encounter some of that, you know, as you as you continue to move forward. So very little information is actually shared about these women, 
but they actually, they definitely were his disciples. But you have to understand the times as well. The little information is a result to the fact that they're, that, you know, when these, you know, when the Bible was written and because of the times that we, they were in and what was going on, it was a very mis, uh, misogynistic, you know, type of culture. Not a lot was said. The society really did not deem women or value them in a, such a high regard. But this just shows you right here, just in the alone in this chapter of the Gospels about who he allowed to be the first ones to even see or get the news allows you, and even them financing the kingdom and what he did for these women uh, lets you know that he considered the women to be valuable, right? Even though the society and the culture did not, he did. They were very valuable and they were definitely at a level that they were not acknowledged at, you know, in those, in that time frame. Well, they followed him. Um, when I'm thinking about, you know, especially Mary, the mother of James, um, and I'm thinking about also, you know, in the other versions of the gospel, they'll talk about even Mary, his mother, you know, coming and, and being there. And so it's something about this, you know, I'm looking at this, you know, from, from different perspective, is that the mother, you know, um, you have in these women, I don't have all the context of all of them, you know, if they were all mothers or children, there are a few of them that were, um, but there's something about a mother's love. It's something about the nature and instinct of a woman, right? So even though this, they had this dedication to, to Jesus because of what he had done for them, it's just still something that's innate within a woman that he, when he created them about being cared for. And the thing is, is that it's just amazing for me to see that at this point, they're headed down to the tomb. They have followed this man and his ministry. They have finances. They would actually go out before him in the places that he was going to, and they would prepare for him to come. So they were with him. They were thick and thin, right and die. They were with him. And here it is. Now he is dead, supposed. And they are still caring for him, even in his death. They're going down, taking the spices, going to basically anoint his body, making sure that decomposure is not a stint. You know, they're going to care for the man. Basically, the teacher has left, but they're still coming to class, <laughs> right? Some of us, you know, I've been in places myself since I've been in ministry and the leadership that if I was to tell certain people I wasn't showing up on Sunday, some people wouldn't come because it was according to basically a personality. And I'm not that charismatic. You guys see that you, I'm not that charismatic. I'm not that great, you know, entertainer or anything like that. <laughs> but we exist in a culture, a lot where that exists, where people are following the personality instead of following God himself, instead of following, you know, being a follower of Jesus Christ himself. And so some things have switched here. And one of the things I want to extract out of this scripture <clears throat> is right there in verse number five, when it says to them, why do you seek the living amongst the dead? He is not here. He has risen. In the context of this scripture right here, I want to kind of bring out and bring us up to date, I should say, and use this lens in order to look at where we are right now. <clears throat> We're going to pause a moment with them going down to the tomb to do this and, 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 uh, for, for Jesus. And then coming up to these messengers who are now there on the right and the left, basically have to remind them of what Jesus told them. And sometimes we're in that same place, right? We come into places like this chapel or we're reading in our devotional. And there's a lot of times where Jesus has to remind us of what he said, doubt will set in. And we'll look at the situations. I mean, come on, if you're walking there, if you watch Jesus crucified, if you watch that with your physical eyes, if you saw how they pierced his eyes, if you saw how they whipped him, your, your physical, consciousness this mind would say is done is dead you would lose all hope and i'm saying you know we do that in our natural situations so where we'll look at the circumstances and we will react to the circumstances instead of look to the god that we serve who's in control of all things who knows the end from the beginning and go to the manufacturer that made us and created us in order to get our direction in order to look through the lens of what he sees and in order to respond in the way that he tells us to respond and not to the way that our emotions is telling us to go. But a lot of times, you know, when we're in these situations, we don't focus on those things. And I think I see that playing out today. 
So you had Friday was when, you know, they, uh, you know, you got the weekend of this, of this events, you know, you got when they crucified him, when they killed him, crucified him. And when he died, you have the burial. And then you have, you know, Sunday that takes place with the resurrection. And so a lot of times what we'll do is we'll exist in Friday. We'll focus on, you know, in some groups actually do that, focus on so much on the death, you know, of Jesus. And when I say focus on Friday, I'm talking about we will complain about the issue that we're in, about what we're going through, you know, about the pressure that we have, about the assignment, you know, that we got. And then when Sunday comes, you know, we're still complaining about Friday and we may have gotten a good grade. We made it through the class. Everything was good. We got a good grade. We made it through the whole 10 weeks or so, got through the trimester, headed out. We'll get into a conversation with somebody else and we'll bring up Friday. You know what happened to me in that class? You know what that teacher did to me? Instead of rejoicing in Sunday and the fact that we've made it through, you know, and everything's good. And I'm saying that about the resurrection is that we'll focus sometimes on the death and not so much on the resurrection. And I'm not saying as far as the songs, and as far as the day when we celebrate resurrection, I'm talking about the life. Look, I'm talking about much deeper. I'm not talking about like how we act it out. I'm talking about how we live it out. You know, are you living on a Friday? Are you living your life as if he is still dead? Or are you living your life as if he is the resurrected savior and he is alive? There's some things that we need to move on. And that's what I'm seeing in this context right here is that you are looking in the wrong place, looking for the right thing, but you're looking in the wrong place. They were looking for the right one, but they were looking in the wrong place. And if you have ever seen the tomb, you know, if you look it up, you know, on pictures and everything, is that it was low, the interest was low. You would have to bow down in order to get into the tomb, you know, itself. So when I when I think about that picture of that, about how they what they did and went through to get in there, is that I, I just want to just offer to them is that you know what you're just looking too low. And I want to offer that to you all as well. As we are in this situation we're in, when I say situation, the way the world is operating right now, I believe that we have to actually lift up our heads, but we also have to renew our mind because we are not only looking too low, but some of us are actually living too low. And we're, you know, we're, and we're looking for the living amongst the dead. We're holding on to some old concepts. We're holding on to some old situations. And God is doing a new thing. You know, he did, he, COVID was not a surprise to our Lord. It wasn't a surprise. And the thing is, is that when I first preached my first message, when we first got into this pretty, you know, to the much like the shelter in place and all of that, then my first message was don't waste a good pandemic. You know, I'm not talking about it's good because of what has happened in it, but I'm talking about God who is good can actually turn this around for our good and don't miss what God is doing in the midst of this whole thing. You know, one thing about this is that, you know, when there is a, a sickness or an illness that comes, you know, uh, to us, you know, we're okay as long as it's temporary, right? We're okay as long as it was affecting somebody else, you know, down the street or in another country, we were okay. You know, but then when it dumped, you know, jumped the water and then it started, you know, invading our space, when it, when it started coming into our states, when it started hitting our home and when it started coming closer and closer to us, you know, then it became a little bit more, you know, even real. And, and that's even the way it is when it comes to our walk with Christ. Sometimes we just can't even fathom, you know, um, what we need him for until we get into a situation that shows that, oh, we, we absolutely need him. And some of you have your own place in your own space if you know where that happened for you. It was that day of revelation to where you realize, Lord, I need you. I can't exist in the same thing. I can't be at the same place meaning I can't be looking for you, the living amongst the dead. Some of those things that were dead, some of those things that I've let go of, I can't go back to those things because you are the living God and I can't live a life that's full of life, you know, and be in a dead place, right? Forgetting those things that are behind me, you know, I press towards the mark. And so when I'm thinking about this process that we're going through this time that we've been in almost a whole year of where this is happening, you know, a lot of times you'll hear, you know, preachers say that God is birthing, you know, something in you, right? Well, and when we hear somebody talk about, about that birth, usually it comes from the perspective of the mother of what she goes through, especially, you know, and they'll talk to you about the whole, you know, pregnancy process and God's doing something inside of you and he's going to birth something in you. And that's all well and good. 
But what I want to kind of as I say resonate, you know, with you guys is that have we ever looked at that? And I don't think no one has. I'm just asking it rhetorically. Has we ever looked at that from the perspective of the baby? I don't think anybody has interviewed the baby, you know, after they were born and asked them, well, how was that experience for you? How did that, how did that work out? Because of course we wouldn't be able to get a response from a baby, but I'm looking, I want you guys to put yourself in the mindset of God, if he's birthing something in me, let me put myself in the mind of not the one that actually is, is the one giving the birth, but let me understand the baby that is coming. Let me understand that there are certain things. And when I say this piece is that when my wife was pregnant, I mean, when it came to the time of that baby coming, being born, my, my son being born, it's a, it's a nine month period. And then the baby can't, can't stay in there no more, right? It has to make a transition. And I believe the time that we're in, in this COVID, in this pandemic, we are in transition. We cannot go back. My son cannot go back to the womb. And some of you, are in wombs that you're too, too big for. And when I say that, it could be a place, but it also could be a mindset, meaning that you know you can no longer be in the same place. You can't even, for some reason, you don't even laugh at the same jokes anymore. Um, that are, they're not even funny to you. Um, for some reason, you know what? Some of some narrow-minded thinking, narrow-minded people and narrow-minded situations actually more get on your nerves than they used to before. You're in a position where you can't even tolerate certain things. You're wondering what's going on. And I'm saying it's maturity. That's what's going on. You're coming to a level of, well, no, there's got to be something more than this. And for those of you who are part of this educational system in this institution, the more that you learn, the, the more you get into that place because you, you won't even listen to things the same way. You won't even listen to things the same way. You will listen to a message and you'll hear something and you'll be like, no, that's not the right context. They took that out of context, your knowledge. And it brings you to a level, not for criticism, but actually you're able to digest it, analyze it, you're able to process it, but you're able to recognize sound doctrine, sound teaching. So when I'm thinking about this, the woman going down there, I'm thinking about the birthing process, about what God is doing to us right now. And I want to put that together in saying that it's time for us to move forward, right? They didn't sit in the tomb and wait. They, they ran to tell somebody, well, they were scared. At first they were scared. They told some of the Bible, but they were scared. He is gone. And I'm thinking that, I want to say in my little Holy Ghost imagination, is that some of the places that we had, that we call the churches prior to the pandemic, um, are waiting to go back to business as usual. And I'm telling you, we cannot afford to go back to business as usual. He has moved on and we need to find out how do we move with the spirit of God? And I'm not putting everybody in that category. I always tell people do what God is telling you to do. But from the conversations I'm engaging in with a lot of clergy, some people don't even know how they're going to make it, what they're going to do after this is over. They're trying to figure it out. And I just tell them, listen to what God is telling you to do. What we can't do is we can't be afraid to switch and to change and to go into a different direction. If we trust the God that we say that we serve and we trust him with all of our hearts, our minds and our spirits and we love him, we will trust him with everything. And if he says, shut it down and go, we need to shut it down and go. If he says, stay and build, we need to stay and build. But what we can't afford to do is to stay in the same mindset as we have been before. So when we, when I'm thinking about it, you know, it's like in the midst of this situation, it's like, I feel almost like in this year, like I, like I, like a baby that's been in the womb and like, I gotta get out of here. Like some of you are feeling that, you know, like within your home, like, I got to get out of here. I got to get out of here. And I want you to have that same mindset about where your mind is, where your spirit is. It's like, you know what? I can't be contained. There's something inside of me. It's the Holy Spirit that's moving and it can't be contained. I've got to get, it out of here. You know, we had to do Mardi Gras a whole different way. And I was interesting as I was hearing, you know, some of the testimonies and I give all praise to God for all that he was doing and everything that he continues to do. I'm in awe of him always. But the other part that was interesting to me is to hear some of the testimonies about how amazing they were about the evangelism that took place within their own city. We had to switch. We had to make a change. We couldn't go back to what we were used to. So we had to do something different. 
But I'm amazed by some of the testimonies I heard because I was under the understanding is that the way that our school is set up is that that's what we do. We practical, you know, practical ministry along with, you know, education. And so I was thinking that, you know, man, haven't we seen, you know, uh, transformation take place? Because aren't we ministering? And are, are we waiting for Mardi Gras to minister to the world? Are we waiting for that opportunity to go out and evangelize? And if we are, that is the old, that's Friday. If that's what we're doing, you guys, that is Friday. It's Sunday now. It's the resurrected life of Jesus Christ. He, the situation has changed. The game has changed. And the word has it. But it's now time that the, the modality of ministry is you got to move. You can't stay in the same place. And you can't afford to wait till things get back to normal. Things are not going to get back to normal because it's a new level in him is what I'm experiencing. And don't miss what he's doing right now. And just understand, and look, you know, if I was in the church right now, I would say, just look at your name and say, I got to move. I got to move. Uh, one thing I just want to share really fast, real quick, you guys, and um, before I end, is because what God is telling me is that the things that go along with this situation is that there's pain. Let me give you guys some points here. You know, I got to be in my, you know, my, 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 my pastoral thing. Pain, prayer, position, preparation, and purpose. Pain, prayer, position, preparation, and purpose. These are what God was showing me in this same thing. He was showing me about how the pain a mother goes through when she is pushing. But guess what? While she's pushing, the baby's pressing. While she's pushing, the baby is pressing. The one causing that. And the thing is that when that, when that baby is delivered, it's almost like that pain becomes non-existent because of the joy of the birth that is taking place. And I'm telling you, as a father, you got to be ready in this process, especially as the baby, you got to be ready to go through some messy stuff, get ready to go through some thinky stuff, and get ready to look sometimes like what you don't want to look like in the presence of others. Because when I tell you, when my son came out of there, I was so happy and rejoicing, but I did not have the same type of reaction of joy that my wife probably had seeing him even in the midst of it. So I was like, what in the heck is on him? Like, get that off of him. What is that stuff, you know? And I'm saying that to say that, you know, as you go through this process and things, that there's some things, there's some residue. It's not just, you know, looked at my hands and they looked through, looked at my feet and they did too. There's some stuff still on us as we're going through sanctification. We have no right to look at each other with that stuff that's on us. We have to see what, like that mother sees the baby. All I see is love. All I see is what God did through me. All I see is what God has for me. All I see is the miracle of the living Jesus Christ. I'm not looking at how you dress. I'm not looking at what color you are. I'm not looking at how you were born. It's time to move on. Move on beyond Pentecostal, Baptist, Methodist. It's time to move on. Move on beyond where I'm black, whether I'm white. It's time to move on. And just to put a pin right there, and don't say I don't see color. No, that means I don't see the beauty of God, what you have created. I've got to see color because God, you are the creator of color. So if I just miss out on the rainbow, just like you can miss the pandemic, don't miss the beauty he has created in each and every one of us. He made you individually for a reason, for a purpose. But yes, understanding sometimes you go to that tomb because things have died that you love. We have lost a lot in this season. So there's pain that's existing inside of us. We have prayer because we're trying to hold on without going crazy. There are people that are committing suicide in this season right now. But what is it about you that God has kept you kept your mind, kept you intact, kept you focused, kept you kept, with the grace of God, you are still here. And even if you have been infected, you are still here today. So what is it that he has for you that in the midst of this, you're still moving, you're still breathing, you're still here. It's a reason because there's a purpose and you have to stay focused on that purpose and understand this position that you're in and prepare for what God is getting ready to do in your life. It's already finished. I just want to tell you that it's already finished but we can't afford to go back to the tomb looking for the dead or looking for the living, I should say, amongst the dead. Identify what those dead places are in your life. Identify. I'm going to actually bring it to a close here because I'm trying to be definitely mindful. I have, you know, I would go on and on and on as a pastor or a preacher would do, but I definitely want you guys to understand that. Don't turn your pain into purpose. And understand the whole context I say, or the theme that I have for this whole thing, I get it to you at the end, is that the church has left the building. The church has left 
the building. No longer are we idolizing the places of worship when we're going to live out our worship in the context of the highways and the byways, and we're going to go ye therefore fulfill the commission of God. But let some of these things go, you guys. There's some things that are distracting us right now in the world, and sometimes we're spending a little bit too much time on those things, and let's just go and be the light and the salt of the earth, and let him say, we don't do that. We draw. We share. We love. We love them to Christ, and with his loving kindness, he draws it to himself. So be blessed, and you guys have a great break that's coming up. I love you all. Love of Jesus Christ. If you don't mind, I'm going to pray for you guys all real quick. Heavenly Father, I just thank you, Lord God, for each and every one that's on this call, Lord God. I pray you for your word today, Lord God. I thank you, Lord God, even for the pain, Lord God, because the pain, Lord God, definitely turns into our purpose. I thank you, Lord God, for the preparation process that many of the students that are going through right now, Lord God, as they are learning more and more about you, Lord God, and as they learn more about you, Lord God, you're revealing who they are, Lord God. In, in you, Lord Jesus, I pray, Heavenly Father, Lord God, for the process, Heavenly Father, that you're giving them. I pray for patience in the process that they will allow patience to have its perfect work so that they will be lacking nothing, so that they can be effective soul winners in the kingdom. And Lord God, let them Lord, continue to have a heart of communication and prayer and boldness to come before your throne of grace, Lord God. All mercy and make the request known to you, Lord God. But let them come in the Father to get their assignment and not to give you orders, Lord God. We give you glory, honor, and praise. We thank you, Lord God, for the chancellor, the staff, the faculty, and everyone that's involved in this institution. And we thank you for the opportunity that we have to be a part of your vision for the end time, Lord God, and for the goal of being together as one body in your pleasure, bright. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Curtis. Pastor Curtis, we really appreciate you and your word today. And um, I don't know about you guys, but I know many times I sit at the grave of the things that died instead of seeing the beauty of the life of what God is bringing out. And Pastor Curtis, you hit on one thing toward the end there. <clears throat> many people may not realize this, but suicide rates and drug addiction rates have uh, skyrocketed during COVID. And so I would say like, not only do you guys need to watch your own mental health, but reach out to someone else, reach out to someone else that you see sitting at the grave instead of recognizing the beauty of what God is doing, help someone else during this time. Um, thank you, Pastor Curtis. I appreciate you. Thank you. You already prayed for us. So thank you so much for praying for us. Everybody have a great week. And we will be back tomorrow for Chancellor's Chapel. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.